the situation in Scotland. Uh, let's have a look at what's happening elsewhere in the UK. In England, for example, there are plans to introduce vaccine passports for entry into nightclubs and some indoor venues by the end of this month. Now, in Wales, the measure is being considered for higher risk settings, whilst in Northern Ireland, a position hasn't been announced yet. So let's find out a little more now with Professor Linda Bold, uh, Public Health Professor, joining us from Edinburgh. Linda, very good morning to you. Do you know what I think might be quite useful is, can you start with a, a couple of really basic things for us? A room full of people, uh, let's call it a nightclub or whatever, who are double, have double vaccination, against a, a different group of people, amongst whom there are people who haven't had the double vax. I mean, kind of outline the difference in those situations, the risks or the benefits. Certainly, Charlie. So there are is two different scenarios. The vaccines do not prevent transmission fully. That's important to emphasize. But they do reduce the risk of transmission. We know that. And also they may affect, for example, how much virus somebody is carrying. Remember, when you're vaccinated, you can still pick up the virus, carry it in your airways and potentially pass it on. But it will not affect your body the same way as it protects against severe disease and mortality. Uh, but transmission is reduced, the risk of it, amongst vaccinated people, particularly if everybody in the room is vaccinated. The alternative are the unvaccinated group, again, able to carry the virus and pass it on. And the thing we really want to avoid, of course, is that by passing it on, somebody may become severely unwell. And the risks are not zero to younger age groups. So that's the scenario. And the government is trying to use this tool, potentially, to be debated in the parliament, not only to make these venues a bit safer, although there are other things you can do as well, but primarily Primarily, the primary reason, Charlie, as I'm sure you've been discussing this morning, is to increase vaccine uptake. And we've seen that in some of the other countries that have introduced similar schemes. I suppose, in a way, public health uh, bosses, and you know all about this, uh, uh, are always trying to do what, the right thing scientifically and medically, but also things that are achievable. Because there's no point trying to do something if, if people aren't going to correspond with the advice or the, the regulation. So we heard from the nightclub owner there saying, well, you bring in the double vax for nightclubs, people just go to a bar and it's a similar situation, but they're not governed by the rules. So it's tricky, isn't it? It is. And all the way through this pandemic, it, the, the straightforward stage, as you know, was people stay at home. That's clear guidance from government. As we opened up, loads of questions arose, and we've discussed them on your program many times, about the inconsistencies in guidance or people not understanding how something might apply to their own situation. And I think the choosing of, for example, how many people um, in an indoor event or outdoors, you know, those precise numbers the Scottish government is talking about, there, there's no, you know, science that differentiates 4,000 from 5,000, etc. But it's the principles. I think the main reasons against this, which will be debated in the parliament today, are things like coercion. Will it put some people off getting vaccines because the government says they has to have to to access certain venues? Inequalities and stigma. Is it a slippery slope? Do we start with nightclubs and mass events and then go to other settings more co comprehensive like Israel and France? Uh, so these are some of the concerns. And then finally, of course, some groups who can't pick, get a vaccine for health reasons, how will they deal with it? And then the final point, which I think, again, you've been discussing on the program, practicalities, as we were hearing from Alexandra there in the nightclub. How will it be administered? What will it mean for businesses? It's not an easy thing to do, but we'll see what the decision is today. Linda, I know we're speaking to you in Edinburgh and the focus very much on the decision that will be made there. Is it, do you think, inevitable, if you look at the rest of the UK, that once, if it goes ahead in Scotland, is there kind of an inevitability around England, the rest of the UK falling into line and going along with what they've done? I think it's probably likely. We've seen this throughout the pandemic, a change in one devolved nation and then the others adopting it. I think inconsistency between the devolved nations is, pro is problematic for people when they're moving around. The other point I'd make is that the international health regulations introduced vaccine certification for yellow fever in 1969. It's not a new thing, and it's kind of a trend that's happening around the world. But the difference is now it's to access key parts of social and economic life. But I suspect if Scotland moves, I don't know, but it's likely that other parts of the UK will as well. Linda, thank you very much. That is Professor Linda Thanks. Bold, uh, Professor of Public Health, speaking to us from Edinburgh, ahead of that vote today about uh, passports, vaccine passports. 18 minutes past eight is the time. Television stars will be out on the red carpet tonight.